All right, guys. Uh, so yesterday we talked about God and government. What does the Bible teach about government and submission and authority? Uh, today we're going to talk about how those principles were enshrined in our founding documents in this country. We're going to talk about the incredible history of America that, uh, unfortunately, they are not teaching our young people in schools. They are not teaching our adults on all the silly fake history shows they have. And... Um, We'll start with some recent stuff. See, this was actually just right before I was born, uh, when Ronald Reagan was president. And uh, the Congress urged him to pass a proclamation declaring 1983 to be the year of the Bible. And to young people today, that sounds like, why would you do that? Uh, well, here is what the declaration said. Uh, of the many influences that have shaped the United States of America into a distinctive nation and people, none may be said to be more fundamental and enduring than the Bible. The Bible and its teachings helped form the basis for the Founding Fathers' abiding belief in the inalienable rights of the individual. So this was 1983. This was, what, 40 years ago. Um, and yet this was still so widely understood and commonly accepted that the Congress, Democrats and Republicans, could urge the President to do this. And uh, there really wasn't a lot of protest. And yet today, if the President were to pass a proclamation like this, there would be protests in the streets, the ACLU would be filing lawsuits, etc. Uh, but this is not new. Uh, if you go back to 1856, the U.S. House of Representatives passed, um, and a after an investigation, determined that America was actually a Christian nation. And uh, here's what they said in their findings. The great vital and conservative element in our system is the belief of our people in the pure doctrines and divine truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and this was uh, a response to somebody who said, no, America's not really a Christian nation. We should stop having chaplains, and we should stop having prayer in Congress. Um, turns out that after Congress investigated, we really were a Christian nation. Now, in 1892, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that America is a Christian nation. There was a case, the Holy Trinity Church versus the United States, and the court found that America is, in fact, a Christian nation. For those of you who haven't seen the Supreme Court, I brought a picture of it. And you see that guy up at the top? That's Moses. And he's holding two tablets. What's written on the tablets? The Ten Commandments, right? Uh, because when our country was founded, that was understood to be the basis of legitimate law. And we'll see that. Now, uh, our Christian history goes back to long before we were a nation. Uh, just in April, I went down to uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, and we had an incredible celebration of what's called the First Landing. Uh, it was the first landing of English settlers on our shores. And uh, they got off. Uh, this was, uh, I believe, April 29th, if I'm not mistaken. They had sailed from England, they had a charter, and uh, they got off, and the very first thing they thought to do was put up a big, giant cross. So they took an extra mast that they had on the ship, and they put a cross beam on it, they put up a big, giant cross, and the reverend, who was the chaplain of this expedition, his name was Reverend Robert Hunt, they actually recorded his sermon, his prayer, and here's what he said. He said, we do hereby dedicate this land and ourselves to reach the people within these shores with the gospel of Jesus Christ to raise up godly generations after us, and with these generations to take the kingdom of God to all the earth. That's really the first thing that they did when they landed on our shores. Okay, this was even before they created Jamestown. This was at Cape Henry. Uh, they would eventually sail a little bit further in and create Jamestown. Uh, that he goes on to say, the Reverend, Reverend Robert Hunt, may this covenant of dedication remain to all generations as long as this earth remains, and may this land, along with England, be evangelist to the world. May all who see this cross remember what we have done here, and may those who come here to inhabit join us in this covenant and in this most noble work that the Holy Scriptures may be fulfilled. And so uh, these settlers saw themselves as entering into a covenant with God. And their end of the bargain was, look, we're going to raise up godly generations after us. We're going to try to reach the people within these shores with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to try to expand the kingdom of God. And um, God lived up to his part of the covenant. Right? They asked that God would use these people and this new land to be an evangelist to the world. What country has taken the gospel to more places on this planet than the United States? And the answer is none. Right? Uh, and actually, right where these guys landed, right next to Virginia Beach, some of you may know this, uh, that's where the Christian Broadcasting ne Network was set up by uh, Pat Robertson. And we can have theological differences with Pat Robertson and still recognize that he reached millions and millions of people around the world with the gospel. And this was set up just miles away from where this first landing was in 1607. Uh, and then the pilgrims came, of course, just a few years later, 1621. And uh, this is amazing to me because I've looked at several government school textbooks and they have the Mayflower Compact section, and they'll say, having undertaken dot, 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 
a voyage. Hmm, interesting. They undertook a voyage. I wonder what the voyage was for. Well, what goes in the dot, dot, dot? Well, you can't say it because separation of church and state means you can't learn history, apparently. Uh, here's what it actually says where the dot, dot, dot goes. Having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country. A voyage. So that's why they undertook the voyage. And see, they don't want the kids to realize this. They want the kids to believe that they came here for slavery or to oppress Indians or to find gold. And, you know, those may have been secondary concerns. But what did we learn about the first English settlers? What did they say? They came here to what? Reach the people within these shores with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why did the pilgrims come here? For the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Right? And yet that's not what they teach the young people in school anymore. They won't even tell them this. They falsely claim that separation of church and state, which is not in the Constitution at all, means you can't teach kids history, which is absolutely preposterous. That's the same reason they use very frequently to not teach the Declaration of Independence. Now, this sentiment reigned supreme for generations in America. Uh, the colonies of New England entered into a confederation in 1643, and here's what they said in their actual Articles of Confederation. We all came into these parts of America with one and the same end and aim, namely to have slaves, make lots of money, and exploit Indians. No, that's not what they said, right? Uh, why'd they come here? To advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel in purity with peace. And it's not separation of church and state issue to teach kids history. Why wouldn't we want our young people to know the history of our country? I think the answer should be pretty obvious. And it will be more obvious after we learn about the Great Reset later today. Uh, so the very first Education Act ever passed in these lands, 1647, was called the Old Deluder Satan Act. Okay, true story. And uh, it's an incredible piece of legislation. You should read it. Uh, it starts off with the premise that uh, one chief project of that old deluder, Satan, is to keep men from knowledge of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Satan doesn't want you to know your Bible. Why? So that he can deceive you. And so these settlers said, well, everybody needs to know the Bible. Everybody needs to learn how to read so that they can read their Bible so that Satan can't deceive them. Now, you know, the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was kind of a, a Bible colony, really. It was, a, you know, church and state fused into one. But uh, they were really passionate about making sure that everybody could read, not just for the sake of reading, not so they could read these weird books they put in the schools today, but so that they could read their Bible so that Satan wouldn't deceive them. Uh, and believe it or not, uh, all of our once great educational institutions were founded as Christian institutions to train up ministers of the gospel. So uh, you have Harvard, for example, which I know it's hard to believe, but at one time it was a legitimate educational institution, and uh, that was their motto. Truth for Christ and the church. Now it's just truth, and yet they don't believe in truth at Harvard. They're, we're in a post-truth world. Your truth is your truth. My, so obviously this motto doesn't make sense at Harvard anymore. There you see their uh, seal. This was actually in their original rules and precepts. They said, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well that the main end of his life and studies is to get a college degree so he can get a good job so he can buy a fancy car and then retire in Florida. No, <laughs> no that, that turns out that's not the main end of your studies. The main end of your life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. I told you, Harvard was a legitimate educational institution at one time. Nobody believes me, but it's true. Okay? And, and it wasn't just Harvard. Princeton University, here was their motto, under the protection of God, she flourishes. There you see the Bible right there on their logo. Yale was also a legitimate educational institution at one time. Uh, there you see the Hebrew, means Urim and Thummim. You find these in Exodus chapter 28, verse 30. These are what the priests use to discern the will of God. It means uh, truth and, or light and truth. Lux et veritas, right? Isn't that interesting? They don't do this stuff anymore, right? Uh, so let's go through a little bit of the history of our great country. So in uh, 1740 to 1760, we had something called the Great Awakening. So uh, we had something of a revival, uh, incredible preachers God raised up, preachers like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, who were just on fire for God. Churches were bursting at the seams, and the founding fathers were mostly children during this time. They were sitting in the churches and absorbing these messages. We'll talk a little bit about the messages when we get to the Black Robe Regiment. And um, this is what led them to ultimately say, we cannot be attached to this uh, wicked regime in the United Kingdom anymore in Britain, and so we're going to have to separate. 
Uh, they were becoming increasingly upset with the despotic, lawless, and godless rule of the British. And, you know, by comparison, it was a very reasonable, small, limited, godly government compared to what we have today. But that's another matter. So they had the Stamp Act. They were very upset about that. 1765, they had the Tea Act, the Townshend Act. And, of course, they argued that this was all a violation of the English Constitution, which was rooted in biblical principles, as we shall see. Uh, now, a lot of them knew their history. See, today, if you ask a, an American, young or old, about the English Civil War, they will have no idea what you're talking about. But this was a very, very momentous event in history, and uh, young Americans and old Americans during the time of our founding would all have been very familiar with this. So you had a king, King Charles I, and uh, he wanted to be a tyrant. He didn't want to listen to Parliament. He didn't, want to, he didn't really care what the people wanted. He didn't even want to obey God. He just thought, I'll just do whatever I want. In fact, he said, I'm going to dissolve Parliament. I don't need you. I can just rule on my own. Well, uh, under the leadership of Oliver Cromwell, a Puritan military leader, uh, the parliamentary forces and Christians joined up and said, no, we're not going to tolerate that. That's a violation of the Magna Carta, which we'll look at in a moment. And um, they said, no, we're not going to accept that. They actually ended up uh, declaring war on King Charles I. They defeated him. They charged him with treason. And they took off his head. No. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Can you do that? <laughs> right? so, uh, and so there's some background here, right? And, and uh, you may have heard of this in school, but probably not. Uh, the whole debate over Lex Rex or Rex Lex, right? This is Latin. Rex Lex, is the king the law or is the law the king? That was what was to be decided. And uh, the English, under the leadership of Oliver Cromwell, said, no, the law is king and the king must obey the law. The king doesn't rule on his own authority. He has authority delegated to him by God, and therefore he must obey the restraints that God has imposed on government. We talked about some of those yesterday. So they were upset about this. They declared war, and they won. Um, and that paved the way for a massive expansion of liberty and representative government in England and then later in the United States of America. Now, there's some background here, too, right? The English didn't just wake up in the 1600s and think, hey, we should make the king obey the law, right? There was some real history here. So it goes back to the 9th century under King Alfred. Uh, he decided, there's some interesting stuff, the, the pagan Vikings had been running wild across the islands and murdering and pillaging, and they didn't like it. Uh, so King Alfred eventually beats them back with help from God, and uh, he decides to write down a legal code. Uh, he took ideas from St. Patrick, from various previous Christian kings, the Ten Commandments, Book of Exodus, the Sermon on the Mount, the Acts of the Apostles, and um, some really, really important legal principles ended up being enshrined in the laws of King Alfred. The idea that rights come from our Creator. The idea that everyone deserves equal justice. The idea that we should decentralize power. We don't want just one guy to have all the power. Right? And our founding fathers understood this very well. They understood the biblical principle that men are wicked, that the heart is wicked, and that if you let men run around unchecked, they will do evil things, which history has proven over and over again. So uh, King Alfred thought some decentralization of power would be good. It also protected the rights of the individual, the family, and the church. Uh, Winston Churchill acknowledged this in his his incredible work, History of the English-Speaking Peoples, he said, King Alfred's Book of Laws, as set out in the existing laws of Kent, Wessex, Mercia, attempted to blend the Mosaic Code, those would be the laws uh, delivered to Moses, with Christian principles and old Germanic customs. There's a very long and rich history in uh, the Anglo-Saxon world, the Western jurisprudence, that all traces back to the Bible. Now, 300 years later, over 300 years later, you had King John, and uh, he was behaving like a tyrant. Uh, that's what kings very often end up doing. And uh, the barons were upset, the clergy was upset, and so they called in uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, and they asked him to help create a document that would bind the king. And so using the Bible as his guide, he wrote this incredible document outlining limits to the king's power. Um, and, and this was really a, a very strange concept to a lot of people. Uh, the world was pretty much dominated by strongmen. Whoever was the strongest man and had the biggest army would take over a territory and basically command everybody else to obey him. What do you mean limits to my power? Who do you think you are? Unless you can depose me, you're going to do what I say. But that's not what they enshrined in the Magna Carta. So in 1250, or 1215, excuse me, 
Um, 25 barons, known as the Army of God, surrounded King John at a place called Runnymede and forced him to sign this incredible document that was written by these barons and the clergy, and it was called the Magna Carta, also known as the Great Charter of English Liberties. And as we go through this, you'll recognize some patterns here with what we have in the United States. And they basically said, King John, if you won't sign it, we are going to declare war on you, and it's not going to end well for you, and so he reluctantly signed. Now, here's what was enshrined in the Magna Carta, rights and liberties for the church, the right to petition for the redress of grievances, no taxation without what the document called common counsel, or what we would know today as consent, right? No taxation without representation. Where have we heard that before? Somewhere, I'm pretty sure, at least some of us, right? Uh, no excessive fines and punishments. No taking private property without just compensation. Some of this is starting to look kind of familiar, isn't it? That you need to have credible witnesses if you want to prosecute somebody. That you should have due process of law. That you should have a right to a speedy trial. And we kind of take these things for granted because, well, it's America. Of course we take these things for granted. But during this time, these ideas were absolutely revolutionary. And of course they came from the Bible, but people almost everywhere lived under despotism. And so to enshrine these documents and to have the, uh, the king sign on to it was very, very significant. Uh, the Magna Carta ends with the purpose, for the salvation of our souls and the souls of all our heirs unto the honor of God. Can't teach that. Separation of church and state, right? Isn't that interesting? Okay, so uh, in response to the Stamp Act, the Massachusetts Assembly said this Stamp Act was against the Magna Carta and the natural rights of Englishmen. Hmm. The U.S. Supreme Court cited the Magna Carta over 100 times in its rulings. It's a pretty important document. Okay, And uh, we talked about some of this yesterday, so we'll uh, maybe skip some of it. But again, these principles are biblical, right? Despite the misinterpretation of Romans 13 that we hear so frequently, that you just have to obey the government always and everywhere, that is not what we see in Scripture. That is not what we have seen for 2,000 years of church history. Uh, was everybody here yesterday? Yeah, okay. All right, so we won't spend a lot of time on this. But you remember the Hebrew midwives were ordered by the king of Egypt to kill the baby boys, and they said no, and God dealt well with them. Uh, we have uh, Moses going up against Pharaoh. We have Elijah going up against King Ahab. We have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refusing to bow down to this giant golden idol that King Nebuchadnezzar had erected. And then uh, and here's what he says. I'll just repeat this again and again. I think everybody should memorize this. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So, Sounds a little bit like what the founding generation said, right? We're not going to comply with that. Uh, and as we'll see in the Declaration of Independence, they didn't trust in their weapons. They didn't trust in their superior military organization. They put their, they put their trust in God. Um, actually, this reminds me, I want to go back and show you guys one quick thing. A statue outside of the British Parliament. You see the statue right here? So there, there's two guys who have statues made of them outside of the British Parliament. One of them is Oliver Cromwell. He was the leader of the forces that rose up against King Charles because he was behaving like a tyrant, the people who eventually chopped off the king's head, uh, after a fair trial, of course. And um, notice what he's holding. In one hand, he's got a sword. In the other hand, he's got a Bible. He distributed a Bible to every one of his men. It was called the Soldier's Bible. It was shortened somewhat because you couldn't have you know, the full Old Testament and New Testament. But the critical scriptures, the critical books were all included in there. Uh, so this is our history. This is uh, what Christians have been doing for a very long time. So uh, going back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we remember that God protected them in the fiery furnace. He saved them from the fire, and then he used that to bring King Nebuchadnezzar to his senses. Now, he didn't keep his senses forever, right? You guys probably remember that story. God turned him into like a, a cow brain. He had to go out and eat grass for a while. Um, so, you know, kings, uh, sometimes they let the power get to their heads. Uh, we have Daniel and King Darius. The king ordered him to stop praying, ordered everybody to stop praying to anyone except the king, and so he went and opened his windows and prayed to God. Total defiance of the law. Uh, we have the Apostle Paul escaping arrest. We have uh, the apostles telling the governing authorities, right, stop preaching in the name of Jesus, is what the government and the authorities, the religious leaders told them at that time. And they said, well, you know, Romans 13, I guess we have to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. 
<laughs> no, that's not what they said, right? Uh, they said we ought to obey God rather than men. Okay, um, And so let's get back to a little bit of American history. And I, I just put that in there, even though we talked about it yesterday, just to kind of remind you, these were not new innovations, right? These were Christians who were reading the Scripture, who were faithful to the God of Scripture, and saying, hey, God's people have always resisted and defied evil commands, evil and lawless decrees by government officials, and so we shall do the same. Now, uh, Sam Adams, the, he's known as the father of the American Revolution, he established what was called the Committees of Correspondence. You may have heard of them. Uh, back before big tech censorship, you had big government censorship. They didn't want people communicating with each other without permission. So they set up this kind of underground network to communicate called the Committees of Correspondence. And the very first document that circulated through these Committees of Correspondence was called Rights of the Colonists. It was written by Sam Adams. And so sometimes you'll hear people say, well, the Declaration of Independence, that, that's just a deist document. You know, Thomas Jefferson was like a, an Enlightenment Freemason and a deist, and uh, this has nothing to do with Christianity. Well, that is simply untrue. Uh, Thomas Jefferson actually didn't come up with these concepts at all. Uh, they came from Sam Adams, and even before that, the Presbyterians in North Carolina. But um, here's what Sam Adams wrote in that very first document that circulated through the Committees of Correspondence as to where your rights come from. The rights of the colonists as Christians may be best understood by going to the Freemason Lodge and uh, worshiping the deist deity. No. no. By reading and carefully studying the institutes of the great lawgiver and head of the Christian church, which are to be found clearly written and promulgated in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. How do we know what our rights are? We read our Bibles. Okay. <laughs> These included, he said, first, a right to life, second, a right to liberty, third, a right to property, together with the right to defend them. See, Thomas Jefferson didn't make this up. This was years before the Declaration of Independence was signed. So uh, after that, 1773, we had, of course, the Boston Tea Party. Uh, the colonies were growing increasingly restless with the out-of-control behavior of the British Parliament and the British King. They proposed creating a Continental Congress. Uh, Britain, of course, was not happy. They retaliated. They started blockading American ports. And the di diverse colonies, and diverse, I mean, you, know, you had Presbyterians, you had Anglicans, you had Congregationalists, you had all these different Christian denominations coming together as one, e pluribus unum, out of many, one, and saying, no, we're going to join forces here and not tolerate this. So they created a Continental Congress in 1774. The very first thing they did was open with a prayer to God. Yeah. Not Hindu, not Buddha, not Allah. <laughs> but to the God of the Bible. The very first resolution was that all proceedings be opened with prayer. But America's not a Christian nation. That's Christian nationalism. You're practically a Nazi, right? So, uh, you guys remember the uh, March 23rd speech by Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. So in 1775, something important happened. On April 19th, the regulars were coming. The British, right? But we were all British at that time, so they weren't really British. But uh, the, the British military was coming. They were not happy by, with all these colonists thinking that they had rights that God had given them and things like this. Um, so the British troops show up at Lexington and Concord, and they say, basically, give us your guns. <laughs> yeah. And the colonists said, no. <laughs> right? We're not giving you our guns, period. That's the end of the story. Um, Pretty amazing. Massachusetts is trying that now, right? Give us your guns. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and so from there, you know, we, there's some confusion about exactly what happened that day. But uh, a shot was fired. And it was the shot heard around the world. Uh, Reverend Jonas Clark, the uh, local pastor there, one of the leaders of the rabble rousers, said, from this day will be dated the liberty of the world. Amen. Okay. So give us your guns. No. And boom, shots fired, right? So uh, pastors actually led the way. Again, this is the history that they won't teach you. Uh, and so you, you go back and read the sermons of the pastors of that era, and it's amazing because they're actually doing what? They're preaching the whole counsel of God. They're teaching people what the Bible says about government, what the Bible says about their rights, what the Bible says about submission, what the Bible says about education, what the Bible says about family, what the Bible says about salvation and heaven and hell and sin and all the other things that God teaches us about in the scriptures rather than just, you know, 51 different versions of John 3.16 and then a Christmas sermon, right? Yeah. So, uh, great, incredible sermons on Christian liberty. Uh, and actually, the churches, like, literally were helping to lead the way. So the pastors often led their men into battle. Mm -hmm. 
Um, they preached about the duty to resist tyrants and to resist evil. And uh, how many have heard of the Black Robe Regiment? Amen. Yes. Yes. Wow, not nearly enough. Marley, you must not be paying attention. <laughs> yeah, you. Okay. Uh, because I know he's heard of it. So the Black Robe Regiment, uh, these were pastors who helped lead American forces during the Revolution. One of them was Reverend Peter Mullenberg. He was a Lutheran pastor uh, in Virginia. And uh, he preached this incredible sermon in uh, December 1775. Uh, he was preaching out of Ecclesiastes. Uh, some of you have probably read Ecclesiastes. There's a time for this and a time for that. And so he says, there's a time for peace. There's a time for war. And that time has come now. And he rips off his priestly garb, and underneath he's got the uniform of a Virginia colonel. And so uh, the war drums start beating in the back, and the men of the congregation go sign up, and they march off to war. It's uh, truly an incredible story. Uh, Reverend Muhlenberg ends up becoming one of Washington's top generals, and many, many other clergy followed. Uh, so let's take a look at the Declaration of Independence. All you really have to do to understand America's incredible Christian history, or at least a big part of it, is to read the Declaration of Independence. And uh, that's one of the big reasons why they don't do this in public schools, one of the big reasons why they don't do this in law schools, one of the big reasons they don't do this in university. They don't want you to read the Declaration of Independence. You might notice that a lot of those same grievances that they had back then are worse now. <laughs> Can you imagine? But uh, so here's what they said. Um, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. So the key part that we want to look at here is the laws of nature and nature's God. To the extent that this is talked about at all in the government school history books that I've looked at, say, like, oh, you know, they, they weren't really Christian. They just had this nebulous conception of a deity. Who, uh, they, they try to frame it as the, the watchmaker, right? He just winds up the clock and then leaves and has no real interest in what's happening on earth with the people he created. And that's simply not true. In fact, the laws of nature and nature's God, it's a very specific phrase with a very specific meaning. And you'll find it in the writings of Sir William Blackstone. Other than the Bible writers, Sir William Blackstone was one of the most quoted individuals by the Founding Fathers in their writings. In fact, he was the most quoted legal scholar, if you don't include the Apostle Paul. And one of the big things that he wrote was Commentaries on the Laws of England. This was published in 1766, and it is considered to be the bedrock of American jurisprudence, the American legal system. And he said, there is a higher law upon which all laws must be based, and this is God's law, the laws of nature and nature's God. He said God's laws are those superior laws and that upon these two foundations, the law of nature and the law of nature's God, the law of revelation, depend all human laws. That is to say, no human laws should be suffered to contradict these. And so if a human law says you can kill people, whether they be born or unborn, is that in accordance with the laws upon which all other laws must depend? No. no, they're not, obviously, right? And are they legitimate then? No. Well, what if the Supreme Court says you, they found in the penumbras of the Constitution a right to kill your baby? No. Still no? Wow, you guys are like smarter than 99% of uh, our lawmakers. Amazing. <laughs> so uh, so that's, that's where these phrases came from, folks. Uh, and if you continue reading in um, Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England, he explained that God's law is revealed in the Bible. And he says this law is binding over all the globe in all countries at all times. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this. And such of them as are valid derive all their force and all their authority, immediately or immediately, from this original. The doctrines thus delivered we call the revealed or divine law and they are found only in the Holy Scriptures. So who believes that the laws of nature and nature's God were just this nebulous enlightenment conception of a deity? It's absolutely ridiculous, right? And nobody in the 1770s who read these documents would have said, oh yeah, that's the deist God that uh, just wound up the earth and then walked away, right? Nobody, okay? So uh, we go on in the Declaration of Independence. We read that we hold these truths to be self-evident. Uh, the original had uh, sacred. Uh, that all men are created equal, 
and that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So where did we get these ideas from? We already studied this, so I hope somebody knows. The Bible, very good. Sam Adams, right, on the rights of the colonists. So Thomas Jefferson didn't invent these ideas, okay? These come from biblical principles, okay? What do you mean unalienable rights that come from God? What kind of idea is that? Well, God said thou shalt not murder. And if God said thou shalt not murder, and government has an obligation to punish evil, which murder is obviously evil if God says not to do it, then you have a right to life. Right. And it comes from God. And it's unalienable. It cannot be taken from you by human beings. It cannot be taken from you by government because the government didn't give it to you. It came from God. The same thing is true, true with your right to property. Where did your right to property come from? From God. How do we know? Because God said thou shalt not steal. Right? It's pretty simple stuff. So, um, they also did not appeal to a generic deity. They appealed to God. They said in the Declaration, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. So they appealed to God for the rectitude of their intentions. Uh, this is actually a flag that was flown during the war. Some of you may have seen it. I don't think we have any here, but it's a very important flag. An appeal to heaven. Uh, and that has a very specific meaning, right? Uh, and if you read the Declaration, you see they appealed to everyone. They appealed to Parliament. They appealed to the King. And what happened? They were laughed at. They were ignored. So in, in our context today, well, we appealed to our state courts. Then we appealed to our federal courts. We appealed to Congress. We petitioned the President for redress of grievances. We went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And they still said, keep killing babies. What do we do? We appeal to heaven. Right? The, he the Supreme Court of heaven trumps all human courts. Amen. And the founding era understood that. If you can't get justice from human institutions, then you appeal to heaven. And so this, this flag actually flew over some of our naval ships in the United States while we were fighting for our independence. Uh, of course, the idea of three branches of government, the idea that God is judge, the idea that God is king, the idea that God is lawgiver, comes also straight out of the Bible, right? Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, but the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, and he will save us. Uh, we don't want to put all those powers in one man, because we know what happens, right? Very bad things, okay? And so after the war, they signed the Treaty of Paris, and the Treaty of Paris begins with, you can see here, it's a, a duplicate, in the name of the most holy and undivided trinity. <laughs> they, must, they must be talking about Shiva and Vishnu and... No, right? They're talking about the God of the scriptures. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, or God the Holy Spirit, right? So, this is our history, folks. And anybody who tries to deny this is either lying to you, or they're so ignorant that all you got to do is get the facts and show them that they're wrong. So eventually in 1787, we formed the Constitution. We replaced the uh, Articles of Confederation. Uh, the founders believed that the Articles were a little bit too weak. They didn't give the federal government enough power to do certain things that they thought the, the federal government should be able to do. But really what they were doing was trying to implement the ideas of the Declaration of Independence and ultimately the ideas of the Bible into a governing document. And, uh, you know, you'll hear smarty pants say, well, the Constitution doesn't mention the Christian God. They obviously haven't read the whole thing. <laughs> In the year of our Lord, who is our Lord? Is that Buddha or Vishnu? Allah? No. They were talking about Jesus Christ, okay? So, yes, our Lord is mentioned in the Constitution, despite what the fake history textbooks might tell you. Um, so... Some other interesting things about our system of government that uh, you won't learn in a government school, you won't learn in Harvard Law School. What kind of government does the United States of America have? A republic. Man, you guys are smart. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Uh, and so actually the, the Constitution in Article 4, Section 4 guarantees that the federal government needs to protect the republican form of government in all the states. It says, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. And when our founders talked about a republic, 
Republic means basically rule of law, right? They didn't mean any old law. They didn't mean that people could just legislate where God has already legislated. They were talking about the laws that we discussed earlier from William Blackstone, right? The laws of nature and of nature's God. Uh, and this is actually what came up in the English Civil War. The king said, I am the law. And under the leadership of Oliver Cromwell, they said, no, you're not the law. God gave the law already and you have to obey it. You may be king and we'll obey you if you're ruling as you're supposed to. But if you try to usurp God's authority and rule in a lawless and godless manner, then we're not going to obey you anymore. In fact, we're going to put you on trial for treason. And chop off your head, right? That's, that's what happened in the English Civil War. And so they thought this had been settled. Obviously, it hasn't been settled. We still have rulers all over the world who think that they are the law. They think they can rule on whatever they want. You've got people on the Supreme Court who think whatever they, the, the Supreme Court is the law of the land. They think that. They say that. I mean, you hear it on TV all the time. Well, that's settled law. The Supreme Court has ruled. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Um, and so, you know, a lot of people today, if you ask them, they say America is a democracy. Um, and you hear this even from alleged conservatives. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, who's coming, uh, I believe, in two days, uh, had to correct Tucker Carlson on stage. Tucker Carlson said, we're a democracy. And Vivek Ramaswamy apparently said, no, actually, we're a constitutional republic. Right. And he's right. right? Um, and so if you want to know what the founders thought about democracy, I know, that's amazing. Huh? So if you want to know what the founders thought about democracy, James Madison is often called the father of the Constitution. Uh, if you go read Federalist Paper Number 10, the Federalist Papers are where the, the founders were kind of defending and arguing against the, the Constitution, the anti-Federalist Papers. Uh, so what he said in Federalist 10 is democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention. They've ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. So what did they see as the problem with democracy? Democracy ignores God's laws. God said, thou shalt not murder. It doesn't matter if 51% or 62% or 73% or 84% of people want to kill you. God already said, thou shalt not murder, and that's the law. You don't get to change it. Doesn't matter how big of a majority you get. Doesn't matter how many clowns in black robes you can get. It doesn't matter how many legislators you can get. God's law says thou shalt not murder, therefore murder is wrong. It is against the law, regardless of what legislatures, regardless of what human courts think about it. Now, uh, one obvious example of democracy was when they killed Jesus. The people have spoken. Well, that didn't work out very well, right? <laughs> I, mean, I guess it was all part of God's plan. But, um, you know, we don't want to leave our rights and what's right and wrong up to the mercy of the mob. So, uh, we have the Bill of Rights that enshrines some of these biblical principles into our federal legal system. Uh, again, this doesn't give you any rights. Right? It's recognizing pre-existing rights. And as we saw earlier, a lot of these go right back to the Magna Carta. Right? And where did the Magna Carta people get them from? From the Bible. That's right. Uh, so, we have the uh, Northwest Ordinance in 1787. This was when they were trying to settle the, uh, the Northwest. They were going to let uh, new states be formed up there. It said, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. So, uh, the laws of property. This is uh, great from a letter from uh, John Adams. It says, the moment... The idea is admitted into society that property is not as sacred as the laws of God and that there is not a force of law and public order or public justice to protect it. Anarchy and tyranny commence. If thou shalt not covet and thou shalt not steal were not commandments of heaven, they must be made inviolable precepts in every society before it can be civilized or made free. So even if God had not said thou shalt not steal, that would have to be a fundamental organizing principle of our society if it was going to be civilized and free. Okay? Uh, and there are societies today still where thou shalt not steal is not really respected. Anybody been to North Korea lately? <laughs> Cuba? Venezuela? Mm -hmm. Not nice places. Okay. Uh, so, uh, morality, right? Uh, John Adams also said our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. If you go back to what we were talking about yesterday, self-government, right? If we cannot govern ourselves, we're going to end up with tyrants governing us. 
Um, we've only got a few minutes left here, so we'll skip some of this. But um, you know, contrast the American Revolution, what happened here in the United States, with what happened in France. Uh, some of you are probably familiar a little bit, at least, with the French Revolution. Right? Similar time period, similar rallying cries, liberty, right? But what kind of liberty did they have in mind? Not the kind of liberty that the Bible prescribes. In fact, they hated the Bible with an incredible passion. They hated God with an incredible passion. They hated God so much they couldn't even tolerate a seven-day week because God, of course, created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. They said, we're going to have ten-day weeks. Right away, they got out the guillotine. They started chopping off heads from clergymen, from Christians. Can't have Christians, right? Uh, and so what ended up happening? A horrific orgy of violence, genocide, Thousands upon thousands of people's heads removed in Paris. Tens of thousands of people losing their heads. Uh, brutal, brutal, brutal. Uh, they brought in a prostitute to Notre Dame Cathedral and uh, worshipped her as the goddess of reason. Um, it was horrific. And France has still not fully recovered from that horror show called the French Revolution. And what was the difference? America's war for independence was guided by the Bible and by the principles that the God of the Bible revealed. The French Revolution was guided by principles at odds with those of the Bible. So, um, Alexis de Tocqueville, speaking of Frenchmen, uh, he came over to the United States in the 1830s and was intrigued. He was absolutely astounded by the incredible goodness of America. And, and he, he ended up writing a, a book about it. I want to read you just a quote from here to kind of get a sense of what America was like in the 1830s, 200 years ago. He says, in the United States, the sovereign authority is religious. There's no country in the world where the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than in America. And there can be no greater proof of its utility and of its conformity to human nature than that its influence is powerfully felt over the most enlightened and free nation of the earth. I sought for the key to the greatness and genius of America in her harbors, in her fertile fields, boundless forests, in her rich mines and vast world commerce, in her schools and institutions of learning. I sought for it in her democratic congress and in her matchless constitution. But not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. The Americans combine the notions of Christianity and liberty so intimately in their minds that it is impossible to make them conceive the one without the other. Christianity is the companion of liberty in all its conflicts, the cradle of its infancy, and the divine source of its claims. So uh, it, it's truly extraordinary what we learn here. Um, now, and I, let's see, I, I have a few more things, but I, I want to share one more thing with you in the last couple of minutes that I have left. And uh, you know, you, you hear very frequently now that, well, America might have a nice history, but America is still evil because America had slavery. How do we address that? How, how did this wonderful Christian nation founded on biblical principles, how do we deal with the issue of slavery? Well, what they've actually done, it's a very nifty and a very evil manipulation and trick. Mm -hmm. See, what they don't tell you is that slavery is an institution that has plagued mankind from the beginning of time in virtually every society, every culture, throughout all of human history, in every part of the world. And then along come these people and say, hey, God said we have rights. God said we're all created equal. God said slavery is an abomination. That kidnapping another man is evil and wicked. We can't tolerate this. And so almost right away, the dominoes started falling for the first time in world history. And a lot of people say, oh, the British ended slavery, not American. That's not true. Okay, you need to read your history. Multiple American states banned slavery before William Wilberforce ever came on the scene. The British abolitionists were inspired by the Americans by the words in the Declaration of Independence. And so the first nation in all of world history to set the ball rolling to end slavery. You know, there are places in the world where slave markets still operate today in the open. The nation of Mauritania didn't criminalize slavery until 2007. The Saudi Arabians, our great allies, didn't criminalize slavery until 1968. You can still buy and sell slaves in the market in Saudi Arabia 50 years ago. You can still buy and sell slaves legally in Mauritania in 2007. So how did the nation that set the train in motion to end slavery all over the world, well, we didn't just stay satisfied with ending it here. We insisted that it be ended everywhere. So how did the nation that ended slavery become the most evil nation in the world because of slavery? It's because they're lying to you. Okay, that's all I have. Thanks, guys.